So remember that around the ankle joint there are proprioceptors which allow the brain to detect the relative position of the ankle. Is it neutral? Is it dorsiflexed? Is it plantar flexed? And to what extent? And so that proprioceptive information regarding ankle joint position is relayed up through the central nervous system, so the spinal cord up to the brain, more specifically the basal nuclei and cerebellum. And then overall the brain makes a decision or a strategy about what muscles need to contract, also which ones need to relax, in order to bring the person back to their original position, back where the center of gravity is directly over the base of support, instead of, in this case, anterior to the base of support. And in this example that you see here on the right side of the screen, this is an ankle strategy. So in an ankle strategy, the perturbation is going to be small amplitude. It's not going to be very forceful. If it's too forceful, you're going to rely on another strategy that we're going to talk about in a couple of videos. But you'll notice here that primarily the movement is at the ankle joint. The blue image right here represents the original position, so fully upright erect posture in standing. Now, as we go throughout this video, we're going to see variations of the ankle strategy where the perturbation is coming from a different direction. So we'll see anterior directed perturbations, posterior, and lateral. However, regardless of the direction of the perturbation, there are certain things that are always true of ankle strategies, and those are these four things right here. The first is the base of support. In order to elicit an ankle strategy, the base of support has to be wide. Now, if you look at RPAs in a textbook, you're going to see the base of support written as either narrow or wide. Okay? It just can't be narrow. It could be shoulder width apart. It could be wider than that, but it can't be narrow. If the base of support is narrow, you're going to elicit a different strategy that we'll be talking about in the next video, which is called a hip strategy. But in order to elicit an ankle strategy, the base of support should be wide. Also, the amplitude of the perturbation needs to be small. If the perturbation is too strong, or too large as we might say, then you're actually going to elicit what's called a step strategy that we'll be talking about in a few videos from now. Also, with the ankle strategy, the detection of that shift in the center of gravity is through proprioceptors in the ankle joint. Okay. So if you look at this picture right here, you'll notice that the blue image is the original position of the person, fully upright, center of gravity directly over the base of support. And the white image is after the perturbation. So clearly there was a perturbation that forced this person's center of gravity to shift anteriorly. Well, in the blue image, which you can't really see down at the ankle, the ankle joint is actually in neutral, zero degrees. So that means that the ankle joint in this white image is actually slightly dorsiflexed. And that change from neutral to dorsiflexion would be sensed by the proprioceptors in the ankle joint. And the order of muscle activation is going to be distal to proximal, meaning that muscles that control the talocrural and subtalar joints are going to be the ones that activate first. So we're thinking about the gastrocnemius and soleus, tibialis anterior, tibialis posterior, and the lateral uh, fibularis muscles, which would be right here. We'll see those as we go throughout this video. Now, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, this specific ankle strategy in the picture is one that was caused by an anteriorly directed perturbation, clearly because the person's center of gravity has shifted anteriorly relative to the base of support. Now, if we think about this logically, their center of gravity is shifted anteriorly, so what do we have to do to get them back to their original position here in blue? Well, we have to reshift their center of gravity back posteriorly. Now, if we consider the tibia down here, we have muscles on the posterior side of it and the anterior side. There's one major muscle we care about on the anterior side of the tibia, and that's the tibialis anterior. And because it lies anterior to the tibia, when it pulls on the tibia, it's going to tend to pull it more anteriorly, which makes sense. On the back side of the tibia and the fibula, there's a bunch of muscles, but there's three that we care about. Really two. One of them is the gastrocnemius, which has two heads, medial and lateral, and then also the soleus. And those muscles combined are sometimes given the name triceps suri. Triceps, three heads, two heads of gastroc, and then the soleus, that's three. And then suri, 
uh, refers to sural. So this region of the calf is called the sural region. So that's where that name comes from. And because these muscles lie on the posterior aspect of these bones here, they're going to be able to pull them posteriorly. So if I asked you, in order to get this person back to their original position, fully upright, erect, center of gravity directly over to the base of support, which of those muscles are going to be best to do that? And the answer is triceps surrey, the gastrocnemius and the soleus, because they lie on the posterior aspect of those bones. They're going to be able to pull them posteriorly back to the original position. So hopefully that makes sense. So you see here, I've got a wider base of support. The perturbation amplitude is going to be small. And that shift in center of gravity is ultimately detected by ankle proprioceptors. And again, muscle activation here is going to be distal to proximal. So the first muscles that are going to activate are likely going to be the triceps surrey. And then I might get some hamstring activation later on and then some paraspinal activation. But the key is that the most distal muscles are going to activate first. So here's another view of this ankle strategy. And an important note here is that when the perturbation amplitude is very, very, very small, you probably won't need the heel to come off the ground in order to maintain balance. However, when the perturbation amplitude is a little bit bigger, still small, but bigger, the heel will probably rise up off the ground in order to maintain that balance. So logically speaking, if the triceps surrey muscle group is used for ankle strategies from anteriorly directed perturbations, it would make sense that the tibialis anterior muscle, shown right here, would be used for ankle strategies from posteriorly directed perturbations, and that is true. So here's an example of the ankle strategy from a posteriorly directed perturbation. The same rules apply. The first muscle that's going to activate is going to be the most distal one, the tibialis anterior. After that, you might get some quad activation, particularly rectus femoris, which is a hip flexor, and then also the rectus abdominis, so the abdominals last, so distal to proximal. You can see the wider base of support, and again, it's going to be due to a smaller perturbation amplitude. You also notice in this case, uh, my toes can come off the ground and I would be balancing more on my heels. And it would be the tibialis anterior that allows me to do that. Another note here is that this particular strategy might be difficult for some patients, especially if they have limitations in dorsiflexion range of motion and or weakness in the tibialis anterior. So even if your tibialis anterior muscle is 5 out of 5, I don't care if you can lift 200 pounds with your tibialis anterior, if you lack the range of motion for dorsiflexion, this is going to be hard to maintain balance. For example, I only have 10 degrees of dorsiflexion in each foot, and that's passive range of motion. Um, and so this particular strategy was actually quite difficult for me. When I actually filmed this anterior view right here, I was actually holding onto a chair with my right hand just so I could make sure to give you enough motion so you could see what was going on. Now, lateral perturbations are ones where the center of gravity shifts either left or right, and so the muscles that activate mainly are going to be the ones that control the subtalar joint, like tibialis posterior right here on the right, and then up here would be the fibularis muscles, in green would be fibularis longus, in red there would be fibularis brevis. So here's an example of lateral uh, ankle strategies. So here, my center of gravity is shifting right. And I'm, of course, using these muscles eccentrically to slow down first, and then concentrically to bring back to the original position. Sorry about that glitch right there. But I want to freeze frame this right here. So at the right ankle here, is the subtalar joint more inverted or everted? Well, in this position, it's more everted. So what muscles would be needed to slow down that eversion, bring it to a stop like I am here, and then ultimately contract concentrically to bring me back upright? Well, it would be the muscles on the opposite side of the joint, and the main one is tibialis posterior. That's the major subtalar inverter. Okay? Now the opposite's true in the left ankle. In the left ankle right here, it's a little bit hard to see, while my ankle is actually more inverted. So what would be necessary at this left ankle to bring this leg back upright? Well, it would be the everters, so the fibularis longus and brevis, okay? So that would be a right lateral ankle strategy. Now for a left lateral ankle strategy, everything is flipped. Now the left ankle is everted and the right ankle is inverted. So on the left ankle, now we'd have to use the tibialis posterior there to bring back up. 
And on the right ankle, we'd have to use the fibularis longus and brevis to help bring back up. So with these lateral ankle strategies, whatever direction the center of gravity shifts, so the direction of the perturbation, you're gonna activate the inverters on the same side and the everters on the opposite side. Hopefully that makes sense. In the next video, we're gonna be covering the hip strategy and after that, step and suspensory strategies. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.